Chapter thirty three of John Dean of Nottingham Historic Adventures by Land and Sea. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. John Dean of Nottingham Historic Adventures by Land and Sea by William Henry Giles Kingston. Chapter thirty three Sir George Hook takes the Spanish galleons in Vigo Bay. Elizabeth's joy at seeing Mistress Pearson was very great, and she did her utmost to comfort her in her affliction, aided by Captain Davis and Dean. As soon as they arrived at Port Royal, Captain Davis took a house for her on shore, where she and Elizabeth went to reside until a plan for their future proceedings could be arranged. Dean immediately wrote to Monsieur de Mertens and told him of his recovery of his daughter, saying that she was still with her kind guardian, in whose company he hoped that he should, without delay, be able to escort her to England. In those days the climate of the West Indies was as dangerous to Europeans as at the present, and ships seldom remained long on the station without losing many of their officers and men. The honest old Admiral Benbow was still alive, although rapidly sinking from the effects of his wounds and his annoyance at the conduct of his officers in the action with the French. Hearing of Jack's conduct, he appointed him second lieutenant of the Ruby, in the place of an officer who had died. He was sorry to leave Captain Davis, especially as he expected now to have fewer opportunities of meeting Elizabeth. He had, however, the consolation to know that Captain Davis expected immediately to be sent home, and proposed taking his sister and Elizabeth with him. John Dean met with no adventures worth recording during his next cruise. On the return of the Ruby to Port Royal, our hero found that the Venus had already sailed, and his ship was shortly afterwards also ordered home. On reaching England, he was immediately appointed to the Lennox of seventy guns, commanded by his old friend Captain Jumper. She formed one of the squadron under Admiral Sir George Rook, just on the point of sailing for the coast of Spain. Being unable to obtain leave of absence, he wrote to Nottingham and Norwich, but before he received answers to his letters, his ship put to sea. Sir George Rook had his flag flying on board the Royal Sovereign. On board the fleet were a large number of troops, under the command of the Duke of Ormond. On the 12th August, they anchored before the harbor of Cadiz. Next day, the Duke of Ormond sent in a trumpeter with a letter requiring the governor to surrender. The brave governor replied that as he had been appointed to the command of the place by his lawful sovereign, he would not yield it up as long as he could hold it. On the 15th, the Duke of Ormond therefore landed with the troops, and in a few days took possession of the forts of St. Catherine and St. Mary. It being found difficult to approach Cadiz while the Spaniards were in possession of Matagorda Fort, an assault was ordered. The Spaniards defended the place bravely, and it was found that the English force was far too small to hope for success. The troops were therefore re-embarked with the intention of returning home. Soon after this, while the fleet was off the coast of Portugal, Captain Hardy of the Pembroke brought the intelligence that the galleons from the West Indies had put into Vigo Bay under convoy of a French squadron. Sir George Rook immediately called a council of war, and it was resolved to make an attack at once on the enemy in the port of Vigo. A strong gale of wind, however, drove the fleet to the north of Cape Finisterra, which prevented their getting off Vigo before the 11th of October. The passage into the harbor was extremely narrow and well defended by batteries on both sides. Across the entrance a strong boom was also laid, 
at each end of which was moored with chains a seventy-four gun ship nearer the boom were laid also moored five ships each carrying sixty to seventy guns with their broadsides to the sea to defend the passage the shoals and sandbanks and the shallowness of the water within the harbor made it dangerous for ships of the first and second rates to enter without a leading wind notwithstanding the strong force opposed to them and the batteries on either side of the harbor the english admirals resolved to attempt the capture of the galleons and it being considered impossible for the larger ships to get up the harbor they shifted their flags on board smaller vessels a boat was then dispatched up the harbor to gain intelligence respecting the disposition of the french and spanish ships this being obtained it was resolved that as the whole fleet could not together act upon the enemy's ships but would from crowding the harbor impede each other's movements fifteen english and ten dutch men-of-war with all the fire-ships would proceed in to destroy the enemy's fleet the frigates and the bomb-vessels were directed to follow this detachment and the larger ships were to proceed in afterwards should their assistance be found necessary it was arranged that the troops should at the same time land and attack the forts on either side of the harbor vice-admiral hopson was ordered to lead the van followed by vice-admiral vandergoes sir george rook commanded the centre division and rear-admiral graydon brought up the rear sir george rook spent the greater part of the night going from ship to ship in his own boat to ascertain that each captain understood clearly the plan of the attack and the part he was to take in it the following morning the twelfth of october the squadron got under way and stood in for the harbor great was the disappointment of all on board when just as the van division had almost reached within gunshot of the batteries the wind died away and it was necessary to anchor a strong breeze however shortly afterwards sprang up when vice-admiral hopson in the torbay cutting his cable crowded every sail his ship could carry and bore down upon the boom the velocity gained by the ship gave her such power that the boom was snapped in two and the torbay was instantly placed between the two french line-of-battle ships the bourbon and esperance these two ships immediately opened a desperate fire upon the torbay which gallantly replied to them though most of her men were falling killed and wounded from the fierce fire to which she was exposed scarcely had the breeze carried her into this post of danger then it again fell and the other ships of the squadron had considerable difficulty in following her while they were endeavoring to get up the harbor a fire-ship was seen descending directly for the torbay on it came the destruction of the torbay seemed inevitable now the flames burst out on either side from the fire-ship the brave crew of the torbay instantly lowered their boats for the purpose of towing her off but two of the boats were struck and swamped and many of those in them were drowned before help could be rendered by those on board just as the flames seemed about to catch the torbay they suddenly decreased and were deadened it seemed almost like a miracle but when the men afterwards examined the fire-ship she was found to be loaded with snuff which immediately the fire reached it completely deadened the flames while this event was taking place vice-admiral vandergoes and the rest of the squadron made their way through the passage which the brave hopson had opened up and directed their fire upon the bourbon which in a short time was captured the torbay however suffered very severely losing a hundred and fifteen men killed and drowned besides many wounded including among the latter captain moody her brave captain while the troops were advancing captain beckenham in the association of ninety guns laid his broadside against a battery of seventeen guns on the left side of the harbor 
and Captain Wyville, in the Barflu, was seen to batter the fort on the other side, while there was a considerable firing from great guns and small arms on both sides. The other ships defending the harbor were now attacked. They replied to the fire of the English with considerable vigor, though they in vain attempted to resist their advance. Meantime, the Duke of Ormond had landed in a sandy bay about two leagues distant from Vigo. His grace, meeting with no opposition, ordered the grenadiers under Lord Shannon and Colonel Pierce to march directly to the forts which guarded the entrance to the harbor where the boom lay. This they executed with much courage and alacrity, and so furious was their attack that they soon made themselves masters of this important fort. The duke himself, at the head of the rest of the forces, in the meantime marched on foot over craggy mountains to support the first detachment. As they advanced, they saw before them about eight thousand Spaniards, prepared, apparently, to contest their advance between the fort and the hills. These, however, only engaged in a little skirmishing at a distance, and, as the grenadiers advanced, they retired. The batteries having been taken, the enemy retreated into an old tower, or stone castle. From thence, for some time, they fired briskly upon the English. It was said that there were nearly twenty thousand French and Spanish troops in and about Vigo at that time. But undaunted by the superiority of the enemy, the British troops pushed on. They plied the defenders of the tower so warmly with their granados and pelted them so sharply with their fusees that they soon made the place too hot for them. Finding this, Monsieur de Sorel, the valiant captain of a French man-of-war, who commanded in the fort, having encouraged his men to make a daring push for their lives, opened the gates, intending to force his way through the English, sword in hand. The grenadiers, however, rushed immediately into the castle, made themselves masters of it, and took nearly three hundred French seamen and fifty Spaniards with their officers, prisoners at discretion. A small party of the enemy endeavored to make their escape through the water, but were stopped by a detachment of the Dutch. As soon as this was done, the boats of the squadron pushed up the harbor to take possession of the galleons. The French admiral, however, finding that all hope of defending the place was gone, gave orders for setting the shipping on fire. Before these orders could be executed, a considerable number of the ships were taken possession of by the boats. Besides seventeen ships, carrying between them nine hundred and sixty guns, destroyed or captured by the English and Dutch, three Spanish men-of-war, carrying a hundred and seventy-eight guns, were destroyed, and fifteen galleons were found there. Four of them were taken by the English, five by the Dutch, and four destroyed. The brave admirals, Rook, Hobson, and Vandergoes, were still furiously attacking the French ships, placed across the harbor behind the boom. Suddenly flames were seen to burst forth from the French admiral's ship. This was soon discovered to be done on purpose, for immediately afterwards they burst forth from the other French ships, from which boats were at the same time seen putting off towards the shore. The French admiral, indeed, finding that the forts were in the hands of his victorious enemies, his fire ship spent in vain, the bourbon captured, the boom cut, and the Confederate fleet pouring in upon him, so that the battle was lost, hoped by burning his ships to prevent their falling into their hands. The order he issued, however, was not punctually obeyed, in consequence of the haste of the French to get on shore. Immediately this was perceived. The boats of the squadron were ordered in to take possession of the galleons. John Dean found himself in one of the leading boats. Onward they dashed, amid the burning ships. On one side the Torbay lay with her fore topmast shot away, her sails burnt and scorched, her foreyard burnt to a coal, and her larboard shrouds, fore and aft, burned to the dead-eyes, 
so that indeed it appeared surprising that she had not been burned altogether. The leading boats dashed alongside some of the largest ships, which were so imperfectly set on fire that the Confederates were unable to extinguish the flames before they had spread far. They then pulled, as fast as they could bend to their oars, up the harbor towards the galleons, which lay at the farther end. Every man had heard of the vast amount of wealth reputed to be on board these vessels, and all were eager to capture them, therefore before they were destroyed by the enemy. Already flames were bursting out from some of them, and the French and Spanish boats were alongside, preparing for their destruction. The Dutch and English joined each other in the race. They rode past the town, which the British troops, having captured the forts, were already entering. Now the boats got alongside the long-looked-for galleons. Already some were in flames, which had extended too far to allow of their being extinguished, but many others were saved. So rapid had been the movements of the Allies that the Spaniards had not had time to remove the cargoes of several of the galleons. These were, in truth, real prizes, and the wealth found on board them stimulated the crews of the boats to make desperate attempts to save the rest. Several, however, just as the flotilla approached them, went down at their anchors, but altogether the larger number were saved. Great was the disappointment of the Allies when they found that the Spaniards had landed the larger portion of the money with which the galleons had been freighted. Seldom, however, has a naval expedition been more judiciously planned and more completely carried out. This glorious and memorable victory, too, was obtained with a very inconsiderable loss on the side of the British, for, with the exception of the loss on board Vice Admiral Hobson's ship, as already described, very few seamen were either killed or wounded, nor did the ships receive more than a slight damage. Of the land forces, two lieutenants and about forty rank-and-file were killed, and five officers and about thirty men wounded. Of the French, about four hundred officers and men were taken prisoners, among whom was the Spanish admiral Don Joseph Chasson, several French captains, and other officers of note. The result of this victory was a vast booty, both of plate and other things, the value of which cannot well be computed. The fleet, indeed, was the richest that had ever come from the West Indies to Europe. The silver and gold was computed to amount to twenty millions of eight, of which fourteen millions had been taken out of the galleons and secured by the enemy before the attack. The rest was either taken or left in the galleons that were burned and sunk. The goods were valued also at twenty millions of pieces of eight, one-fourth part of which was saved by the Spaniards, nearly two parts destroyed, and the other fourth taken by the Confederates. Besides the property already mentioned, there was a great deal of plate and goods on board belonging to private persons, most of which was taken or lost. The prize money which thus fell to John Dean's share was very considerable, and it induced him to begin setting up a castle in the air, which he hoped to commence in a more substantial manner on his return to England, as he expected by the time he should get there to find Elizabeth restored to her parents, as he had left with her and Captain Davis full directions by which they could be found. One thing most remarkable with regard to this victory was not only the courage and sagacity of Sir George Rook and the other admirals, but their readiness to sacrifice themselves and to risk their safety to ensure the success of the undertaking. This was shown by the way in which they left their large ships and placed themselves on board the smaller ones, as also by their leading the way into the myths of the enemy, strongly posted as they were. Great credit was also due to the land forces for the mode in which they cooperated with the navy. Scarcely had the action concluded when Sir Cloudsley's shovel, with a large squadron, hove in sight. 
the duke of ormond proposed to keep possession of vigo for don carlos considering it a safe place for the army to take up their quarters in having a naval force to assist them sir george rook however thought that it was necessary to return home for want of stores and provisions he left therefore sir cloudsley shovel to whom was entrusted the task of fitting out the prizes he succeeded also in rescuing a large portion of treasure from the sunken galleons and he recovered the dartmouth an english fifty-gun ship which had been captured in the previous war he also took out of some of the french ships lying aground partially destroyed fifty brass guns and about sixty from the shore and before sailing from the port he completed the destruction of every ship that he could not bring away the importance of this success was very great as not only did the spaniards suffer a heavy loss but the naval power of france was considerably crippled by it nor indeed did she during the war recover from its effects jack remained with the fleet under sir cloudsley shovel all hands were busily employed in fitting out the captured ships and preparing them for sea at length in a week all those fit for sea were got ready when the rest amounting to a considerable number were set on fire and the squadron as the flames bursting fiercely forth sent them to the bottom sailed away down the harbour on the twenty fifth of october sir cloudsley got clear of vigo but it proving calm he anchored in the channel in the port of bayonne where with a flag of truce he sent several prisoners on shore receiving some english who had been captured by the spaniards the next day he got under sail again with the intention of going through the north channel but the wind taking him short he was obliged to drop anchor here a galleon a prize to the monmouth struck upon a sunken rock immediately the water rushed into her and before it could be pumped out she foundered fortunately several frigates were on each side of her and their boats putting off all her crew were saved with the exception of two who were below the same day the fleet was joined by the dragon a fifty-gun ship lately commanded by captain holyman one of the officers came on board and gave an account of an engagement she had just had with a french man-of-war of seventy guns in spite of the vast superiority of the enemy captain holyman defended his ship with the greatest resolution his crew worked their guns in a way british seamen have ever known how to do when alongside an enemy at length the captain was killed when his first lieutenant fatherby continued the defence urging his men not to strike as long as they had a cartridge remaining and a shot in the locker at length although themselves greatly crippled they had the satisfaction of seeing the enemy brace up her yards and stand away loud cheers burst from their throats though they had at first believed she had merely hauled off to repair damages however she continued standing away and ultimately her top sails disappeared below the horizon besides her brave captain the dragon lost twenty-five of her crew killed and many more wounded the fleet on their passage home encountered very bad weather one of the ships the nassau had in spite of the gale the good fortune to make a rich prize standing in towards the fleet however the sea ran so high that the prize foundered the gale continued to increase and the whole squadron was thus separated every ship shifting for herself at length all got into the downs End of chapter 33chapter thirty four of john dean of nottingham historic adventures by land and sea this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by dion gines salt lake city utah john dean of nottingham historic adventures by land and sea by william henry giles kingston 
Chapter Thirty Four, Hurricane in the British Channel, Sir George Rook takes Gibraltar, Sea Fight off Malaga. On reaching England once more, our hero had great hopes of being able to get on shore to visit his own family, as well as to make inquiries about Elizabeth, of whose arrival he had not yet heard. He had actually obtained leave to go on shore, and was proposing to set off the following day, when he experienced the truth of the old saying, "'There is many a slip between the cup and the lip.' On the 26th of November, while his ship lay in the Downs, the weather having hitherto been fine, about eleven o'clock the wind began to blow most violently from the west-southwest. John Dean was the officer on watch. He had been walking the deck for some time, looking out on either side, for those were days when it was necessary for seamen to have their eyes about them when he observed in the quarter from whence the wind was coming bright flashes of lightning. Soon the sea appeared through the gloom covered with a sheet of foam. Every instant the lightning increased in vividness, and now loud roars of thunder reverberated through the sky. Clouds came rushing on in vast masses. "'Call the captain,' said Dean to the midshipman of the watch, we are going to have a night of it, and he's not the man to remain in his bed at such a time. All hands on deck, he shouted immediately afterwards. The crew came rushing up from below with a speed which would have astonished anyone, not knowing how quickly sailors can put on their clothes, many of them indeed, bringing them up in their hands and dressing on their way. Strike top gallant masts he cried out. Mr. Grummet, range another cable for the best bower anchor. We shall want every anchor out tonight. Scarcely had these judicious orders been given when the captain himself came on deck and took the command, next ordering the topsail yards to be lowered and the top masts to be housed. Now, with a loud roar, the gale burst upon the fleet, which lay at anchor in that exposed situation. The sea, rising rapidly, torn up by the furious tempest, caused the ships to pitch and roll in a fearful manner, as if it would wrench them from their anchors and drive them against the dangerous Goodwin Sands. As Jack looked out, he could see, indeed, some of the ships torn away from their anchors, apparently, and driven hopelessly before the gale. Over others the sea was breaking furiously, sending the spray high above them, and seeming every moment about to carry them to the bottom. Those who had been in many a battle, and gone through many a storm, felt their hearts, for the first time perhaps, sinking with fear, as the thunder crashed above their heads, and the lightning flashed about the masts, while the foaming seas dashed up and round them on every side. The position of the Lennox was indeed perilous in the extreme, and little comfort could her crew gain by watching the fate of others. A large ship lay within sight. She was the Mary, with Rear Admiral Beaumont's flag flying on board. Sea after sea came dashing and breaking over her. Now those whose eyes were turned in that direction saw that she began to move, she is driving she is driving exclaimed several an instant afterwards she was seen carried before the gale and ere many minutes had passed was thrown helplessly upon the good ones scarcely had she touched the fatal sands when her masts bending like willow wands went by the board the seas leaped triumphantly over her and in the short time of one hour scarce a timber of the stout ship hung together, while those who looked on knew well what must be the fate of all her brave crew. Not a man could be expected to live in that foaming sea. The same fate might any moment be the lot of those on board the Lennox. Thus the whole night was passed, no one knowing whether the next hour would not be their last. 
For a long time the gale gave no signs of abating. The thunder roared as loudly as ever, and the lightning flashed round their heads. Sometimes, as the vivid lightning enabled them to pierce the otherwise surrounding gloom, they saw far off some noble ship torn from her anchors, or the masts of another disappearing beneath the waves. When morning broke at length, fearful was the scene of destruction which met their gaze. Here and there fragments of wreck could be distinguished on the good ones, while many other ships which had escaped the hurricane presented a shattered and forlorn appearance. By seven o'clock, providentially, the wind began to fall, and in a short time it ceased almost as rapidly as it had commenced. Sad was the number of ships which had foundered. Among those in the Downs was the Northumberland, not one of her company having escaped. The Stirling Castle had also gone down, seventy of her men only having got on shore in their boats or on pieces of the wreck. Of Admiral Beaumont's ship, one man alone was saved on a piece of wreck, having been tossed about all night till at length he was cast on shore. The mortar, bomb vessel, had all her company lost. The number of sailors lost on the Goodwin Sands during that fatal night, and on all parts of the coast, many more being cast away in those few hours of the gale, amounted to fifteen hundred and nineteen. Thirteen men of war were totally wrecked besides many others greatly injured. The newly erected Eddystone Lighthouse was also blown down and entirely destroyed, the unfortunate men who had charge of it losing their lives. Several ships were forced from their anchors. Among them was the Revenge, which drove over to the coast of Holland, where she was nearly cast away. Happily, however, Sail was got on her, and she arrived safely in the river Medway. Another ship, the Dorset, after striking three times, drove a fortnight to sea, where she was knocking about in an almost helpless state, till she was enabled to jury-rig masts and thus get safe back to the Nore. In London the accidents which happened were numerous, and a large amount of property was destroyed. The gale blew down a multitude of chimneys and even whole buildings, lifted the tops of houses, tore up a number of trees in St. James Park, in the Inns of Court, Moorfields, and at other places, by the roots, and broke off others in the middle. Several people were killed in their beds, among them Dr. Kidder, Bishop of Bath and Wells, with his wife. A great number of vessels, barges, and boats were sunk in the River Thames, and the arches of London Bridge were stopped with the wrecks of them. On the 12th of December the Queen published a proclamation for a general fast, which on Wednesday, 19th January following, was kept with great strictness. The order in council also appeared in the Gazette, for an advance of wages to the families of those officers and seamen who had perished in the storm, in the same manner as if they had been killed in battle. The House of Commons also addressed Her Majesty upon this melancholy occasion, desiring her to give directions for repairing this loss, and to build such capital ships as she should think fit, and promising to make good the expense at their next meeting. Thus, great as was the loss, the British Navy was restored to that state of efficiency which it is most important that it should ever maintain. John Dean had a great disappointment in not being able, after all, to leave his ship. As soon as the damages she received in the storm were repaired, she was ordered to rejoin the fleet under Sir George Rook. That admiral had been directed to convey the Archduke Charles of Austria to Lisbon. Before the fleet had reached Finisterra, another violent storm arose, which dispersed the ships and drove them back into the channel. The tempestuous weather prevented the admiral from sailing before the 5th of February, and on the 15th of the same month he arrived at Lisbon. 
a short historical account is now necessary that the cause of the long war in which england was engaged may be understood the king of spain who died in seventeen hundred declared by his will real or pretended the duke of anjou grandson to louis the fourteenth king of the whole spanish monarchy the spaniards finding themselves threatened with war by the emperor of germany and by england in conjunction with the united provinces delivered themselves up into the hands of france in consequence both the spanish netherlands and the duchy of milan received french garrisons and the french fleet came to cadiz a squadron was also sent to the west indies so that the whole spanish empire fell into the hands of the french the duke of burgundy then having no children the king of spain was likely to succeed to the crown of france and thus the world saw that a new universal monarchy might possibly arise out of this conjunction hence arose the war of succession in spain with the object above mentioned of placing the duke of anjou on the throne of spain louis had sacrificed his charming and clever niece the granddaughter of our king charles i and henrietta maria to an imbecile husband the thought of whom was hateful to her and he also had engaged in a variety of other intrigues with the same object the spaniards in general gave the preference to the archduke charles or don carlos who was the legitimate heir of the spanish monarchy second son of the emperor of austria the object of louis was first to secure his own authority over the dutch secondly to injure the trade of england and also of holland and thirdly to overthrow protestantism in all the countries under his influence the object of william and the british government on the other hand was first to exclude louis from the netherlands and west indies secondly to prevent the union of france and spain in the person of the duke of anjou or his posterity and thirdly to maintain the protestant religion wherever it was established including the vado provinces with these objects william had exerted his utmost energies to form the grand alliance of england austria and the states general against france to these were afterwards added some of the italian states and portugal the war of succession lasted from first to last fifteen years it ended by the accession of the archduke don carlos to the imperial throne of germany and philip v duke of anjou was then acknowledged by all european sovereigns king of spain on the condition of renouncing all claim to the throne of france for himself and his descendants the war had now continued for about two years the chief exploit which had hitherto been performed was the capture of the galleons in the harbor of vigo which has already been described the archduke having landed at lisbon marched into spain with a considerable body of troops but was not able to make any progress for a considerable time sir george rooke with the fleet proceeded into the mediterranean and made an attack on the important town of barcelona the fleet at length anchored in the roads of tatuan when on the seventeenth of july sir george rooke called a council of war and placed before the members a plan he had devised for attacking the fortress of gibraltar strong as it was he believed that there was a prospect of capturing it having received information that the garrison at that time was but small it was a place also likely to prove of infinite importance during the war then going on and it was hoped that the attacking this fortress would give a luster to queen anne's armies and possibly induce the spaniards to favor the cause of king charles as no time was to be lost the fleet sailed in consequence of this resolution for gibraltar and prepared for battle took up a position in the bay on the twenty first of july as the british gazed up on the lofty rock surmounted by cannon 
they might well have felt that it would require all their bravery and hardihood to conquer the place it must be ours exclaimed john dean as he looked up at it while he walked the quarter-deck it shall be observed captain jumper who overheard him dean you shall accompany me on shore and i hope before the world is much older you and i shall find ourselves inside those walls or buried under them said dean for my part however i would as lief be on the top of them meantime the marines english and dutch to the number of eighteen hundred were landed on the isthmus by which the rock is joined to the mainland to cut off all communication between the town and the continent it was only of late that this fine body of men had been organized and received the name of marines their duty being especially to serve on board ships they were under command of the prince of hesse his highness having taken post on the isthmus summoned the governor to surrender but that brave officer returned an answer that he would defend the place to the last on the twenty second the admiral at break of day gave orders that the ships which had been appointed to cannonade the town under the command of rear admiral bing and rear admiral vanderdozen as also those which were to batter the south molehead commanded by captain hicks of the weymouth should arrange themselves accordingly the wind however blowing contrary they could not get into their places till the day was well nigh spent in the meantime to amuse the enemy captain whittaker was sent in with some boats and a french privateer of twelve guns was burned at the old mole on the twenty third soon after break of day the ships being all placed in their stations the admiral gave the signal for beginning the cannonade and now the guns opened with a furious fire the shot like hail flew against the spanish batteries the british seamen firing as fast as they could load in five or six hours upwards of fifteen thousand shot were calculated to have been discharged against the town and the enemy were driven from their guns especially at the south molehead seeing this the admiral sent an order to captain whittaker to attack the town with all the boats of the fleet in the meantime however captain jumper who saw what was necessary to be done and captain hicks who both lay next the mole had pushed on shore with their pinnaces and some other boats before the rest could come up john dean and two other lieutenants accompanied their captain they rushing forward as british seamen always will do when led by their officers took possession of the fort with great bravery but not without sustaining a considerable loss as they with swords and pistols in their hands were rushing on suddenly a fearful noise was heard the earth seemed to lift up beneath their feet and forty men and two lieutenants were carried up fearfully burned and shattered the survivors among whom was john dean undaunted by this disaster fought their way on and took possession of the grand platform where they remained until reinforced by a body of seamen who had come in the boats under captain whittaker the whole body then advanced and took a redoubt halfway between the mole and the town possessing themselves also of many of the enemy's cannon the admiral then sent in a letter to the governor and at the same time a message to the prince of hesse directing him to send a peremptory summons which his highness accordingly did while this was taking place john dean who had previously surveyed the rock got leave from captain jumper to lead a body of men up a part of the cliff which the spaniards had never thought it possible any human beings could climb dean however had often scrambled over the nearly perpendicular rock on which nottingham castle stands and up its old rugged towers which yet remain he had no lack of volunteers with two or three midshipmen ready to accompany him stealing away unperceived by the enemy they got to the foot of the cliff with their pistols in their belts and swords between their teeth 
they commenced the perilous ascent many who saw them thought they would never succeed but they had resolved to persevere slowly but surely they proceeded up hanging on by each craggy projection aided by the shrubs which here and there grew from between the crevices of the rock at length when one after the other they reached the summit they saw before them a chapel filled with women with a vast number of others coming in and going out of it these poor creatures had come out of the town prompted by their superstitious notions to implore the protection of the virgin to whom the chapel was dedicated jack and his followers springing forward threw themselves between the chapel and the road which led to the town by gestures more than by words he endeavored to persuade the frightened matrons and damsels that he and his followers would do them no harm with difficulty however he could make them understand this though he signified by signs that they were all to get inside the chapel again their fears were somewhat overcome when they found that no insult was offered to any of them he allowed however one of them to go back into the town to inform the governor that they had fallen into the hands of the english the governor finding that the forts were in possession of the english and that a large number of women had also fallen into their hands consented to agree to the terms proposed by admiral rook hostages were accordingly exchanged and the capitulation being concluded the prince of hesse marched into the town in the evening and took possession of the land and north mole gates and the outworks the spanish troops were allowed to march out with all the honors of war and provisions for a six days march such inhabitants and soldiers who were willing to take an oath of fidelity to don carlos the third were allowed to remain the spaniards were also to discover all their magazines of powder and other ammunition or provision and arms in the city all subjects of the french king were however excluded from any part of the terms of this capitulation the town was found to be extremely strong with a hundred guns mounted facing the sea and the narrow pass towards the land it was well supplied with ammunition but the garrison consisted of only a hundred and fifty men however in the opinion of officers who examined the works fifty men might have defended them against thousands so it was acknowledged that the attack made by the seamen was brave almost beyond example the british lost sixty men killed including two lieutenants and one master and two hundred and sixteen wounded including one captain seven lieutenants and a boatswain it is but justice to the naval part of the expedition to remark that as this design was contrived by the admiral so it was executed entirely by the seamen and therefore the whole honor of it was due to them nothing indeed could have enabled the seamen to take the place but the cannonading of it in a way which obliged the spaniards to quit their posts after leaving as many men as could be spared to garrison the place under the command of the prince of hesse the fleet sailed for tetuan in order to take in wood and water immediately the fleet had watered it stood out again towards gibraltar when on the twelfth of august about noon the enemy's fleet and galleys were discovered to the westward near cape malaga going free the allied fleet accordingly bore after them in a line of battle on the morning of the thirteenth of august they were within three leagues of the french and then brought to with their heads to the south the wind being east and lay in a posture to receive them in the english line sir george rook with rear admirals bing and dilks were in the centre sir cloudsley shovel and sir john leake led the van and vice-admiral Collenberg and rear-admiral vanderdozen commanded the ships in the rear the english fleet consisted of forty-five ships of the line and eighteen smaller vessels the dutch had only twelve ships of the line while the french fleet consisted of fifty ships of the line eight frigates 
and eleven smaller vessels the line of battleships alone carrying three thousand five hundred thirty guns while the english ships together only carried three thousand one hundred fifty four guns and the dutch ships about one thousand guns though the french endeavored at first to avoid the battle yet they had the advantage over the combined fleet as they were superior in force and all their ships were clean and fully manned they had also the advantage of fighting on the coast and near a harbor of their ally and had the benefit of a large number of galleys the confederates on the contrary besides being away from any friendly port were thinly manned and had a great deficiency of stores and provisions while the foulness of their ships was greatly to the prejudice in the day of battle notwithstanding this they were eager for the engagement the action which was about to commence was likely to prove of far more importance than any in which dean had hitherto engaged and his heart beat high as he saw the ships of england bear down upon the enemy his own ship the lennox was among those under the command of the brave admiral sir cloudsley shovel at about ten o'clock when nearly half gunshot from the enemy the french set all their sails at once and seemed to intend to stretch ahead and weather the english fleet admiral shovel on discovering the enemy's intention hauled his wind and sir george rook seeing what would be the consequence if the van was intercepted bore down upon the enemy with the rest of the confederate fleet and put out the signal for a fight which was immediately begun by admiral shovel the battle raged with great fury on both sides till about two in the afternoon when the enemy's van gave way the dutch engaged the enemy with the greatest courage and alacrity and being provided with ammunition continued firing something later than the rest but night coming on put a stop to the engagement several of the french ships were compelled to quit the fight long before it was over to repair damages some of them to stop leaks which would otherwise have caused them to founder the french main body being very strong with several ships of the admirals and rear admirals being and dilk's divisions being also forced to go out of the line for want of shot the battle fell very heavily on the admiral's own ship the st george as also on the shrewsbury this being observed by sir cloudsley shovel he like a good and valiant officer immediately backed astern and endeavored to reinforce the admiral this act of valor and of good seamanship had two useful effects first it drew several of the enemy's ship from the british center which was so hard pressed by a great superiority of strength and numbers and secondly it drove them at length out of the line for after they had felt the effects of the guns of others of the ships of sir cloudsley shovel's division which were astern of him they considered it more prudent not to advance along his broadside being clean and better sailors they set their split sails and with their boats ahead towed away from him without giving him the opportunity of exchanging a single broadside with them there can be no doubt that the british would have gained a complete victory had they not have been in want of shot this had been expended by the vast number of guns fired at gibraltar though every ship had been furnished with twenty-five rounds the day before the battle which would have been sufficient had they got as near the enemy as the admiral intended as it was every ship had expended her ammunition before night in the centre of the line a furious action was going on the serio a ship in the french admiral's division commanded by monsieur champmelin however boarded the monk an english ship commanded by captain mills he with great activity and courage every time cleared the deck of the enemy and made them at last bear away the same french commander had his ship afterwards so disabled that he was obliged with others to quit the line 
captain jumper also added laurels to those he had already gained by engaging with his single ship three of the enemies and on this occasion as he had done at gibraltar john deane especially distinguished himself captain jumper shook him by the hand and thanking him for the aid he had afforded promised him that he would not rest till he had recommended him for promotion to the admiral about seven in the evening one of the french admiral's seconds advanced out of the line and began a closer engagement with the st george commanded by captain jennings but although the st george had already suffered much the french ship met with such rough treatment that she had great difficulty in rejoining the line after the loss of both her captains and many of her men among the actions of other brave commanders that of the gallant earl of dursley commander of the boyne an eighty-gun ship must be mentioned he was but twenty-three years of age yet he gave numerous instances of his undaunted courage steady resolution and prudent conduct the battle ended at the close of the day when the enemy escaped with the help of their galleys to leeward in the night the wind shifted to the north and in the morning to the west which placed the enemy on the weather side of the confederates their fleet lay by all day within three leagues of the french at night the latter stood away to the northward the english lost six hundred eighty seven men killed and one thousand six hundred thirty two wounded the loss of the french was a rear admiral five captains and a number of other officers killed with one hundred fifty wounded and upwards of three thousand men killed or wounded sir cloudsley's shovel afterwards declared that this engagement was the most desperate that had ever taken place between two fleets in his time scarce chapter thirty five of john dean of nottingham historic adventures by land and sea this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by dion gines salt lake city utah john dean of nottingham historic adventures by land and sea by william henry giles kingston chapter thirty five home again another bitter disappointment soon after the battle which has been described the fleet once more returned to england the admirals and many of the captains were presented to queen anne who complimented them on the actions in which they had been engaged among the officers who received promotion was john dean who was raised to the rank of captain at length as he was now without a ship he was able to set forward to pay his long promised visit to his home in those days the post was very irregular on shore and sailors often went many years without receiving letters from home such had been john deane's case and he still remained in ignorance of all the events which had taken place among those he loved since his departure one thing had troubled him greatly it was at not hearing of the arrival of elizabeth and her faithful guardian mistress pearson he had gained a large amount of prize money which the agent at portsmouth where he landed promised to remit to him at nottingham he took with him only a sum sufficient for his journey and to supply his wants while he expected to remain on shore he met with no adventure during his journey the number of loose characters who had infested the roads in the early days of king william's reign had been drawn away to fight the battles of their country either under marlborough or at sea and few highwaymen were to be met with in any part of the country dean would gladly have turned aside to go to norwich but it was greatly out of his way and he felt that it was his duty in the first place to visit his own father and mother 
he could scarcely restrain his eagerness as he passed over the trent bridge once more and took his way through the well-known streets which led to the market-place it was early in the day but no one knew him in his richly laced coat his countenance well bronzed by sun and wind and his whiskers and beard of no mean growth at length he stopped before the door of the old house and threw himself from his horse calling to a boy passing at the moment to hold it not till then did it occur to him how long he had been absent and what great changes might have taken place his heart sank for he expected almost to see his mother hurrying to the door with his old father's fine countenance peering behind her but the door remained closed and he had to knock more than once before it was opened his voice trembled as he inquired of the serving damsel who opened the door whether mr and mistress dean were at home ay was the answer they are in the parlor at the back of the house he pushed past her and hurried on the old gentleman and lady rose from their seats as he threw open the door at first not knowing him to what cause do we owe the honor of this visit sir said old mr dean taking jack to be an intruder or one of the officers quartered in the town engaged in a frolic he is our son our son jack exclaimed mistress dean who knowing him at a second glance threw her arms around his neck old mr dean hurried forward and grasping his hand almost wrung it off then his mother bestowed her kisses on his bronzed cheeks yes it's jack i know him now exclaimed the old gentleman drawing back a pace that he might look at him from head to foot well thou art grown into a brave lad jack he said looking at him affectionately and now jack was seated between the two old people who scarcely would allow him to ask any questions so eager were they to hear his adventures it was some time therefore before he could learn what had become of the rest of the family and how is sister polly and her husband tom dovedale it seems an age since the day they were spliced they live six doors off and are wonderfully flourishing for from morning to night they do little else than laugh and grow fat was the answer and jasper where is he was the next question the father of two fine cherubs and alethea as beautiful and cheerful as ever he is a fortunate fellow your brother jasper cousin nat now lives with him and has given him up all his business so that jasper is the leading physician in the town and on my word he bears his honors bravely and is in no way behind cousin nat in the estimation of the townspeople and neighborhood at first i feared that jasper and alethea would not have got on very smoothly together she as you remember was a warm jacobite as was her poor father but jasper argued the matter so well with her that he soon brought her over and she became as loyal a subject of king william as any to be found within the realm had it not been indeed for her marriage to jasper it would have gone hard with her for poor harwood was so implicated in the plot against king william that his property would have been confiscated cousin nat and his other friends however so earnestly petitioned the government that it was preserved for the sake of his daughter and jasper after poor harwood's death became the squire of harwood grange and have you heard from kate and dainsforth mother asked jack he had another question which he was eager to ask but he wished first to inquire about his own family oh yes they're flourishing in their new plantation and glowing are the accounts which they send us of the country it must be a wonderful place and although the free government we now enjoy makes fewer people wish to go over there yet many are tempted from time to time from the accounts they receive from their friends settled there jack's next inquiry was about mr gournay at norwich 
he could only learn that a foreign lady and gentleman were residing at his house but not a word about elizabeth could they tell him he concluded that they alluded to monsieur and madame de mertens but they were not aware even that they had a daughter nor could they give him any account of the arrival of their supposed daughter jack's visit to jasper and alethea and to cousin nat must be briefly passed over having spent a few days at nottingham he became eager to visit norwich he found will brinsmead who in spite of his age continued his journeys through the country about to set off in that direction will begged that he would give him the honor of his company but jack laughingly assured him that though he should have great delight in talking over old days his eagerness to reach norwich would not allow him to jog along behind the cattle he however rode a few miles with him when just as the old man was beginning one of his lectures on the pilgrim's progress jack shaking him warmly by the hand pushed on his steed in advance of the herd on making himself known to mr gournay he was received in the kindest way by him and his wife but jack's astonishment and disappointment was very great when he found that they had not received the accounts he had sent home of his discovery of elizabeth and of her proposed return with mistress pearson under charge of captain davis to england monsieur and madame de mertens were residing he found in a small house in norwich and that they also had not received either his letter or one from captain davis his heart sank within him what was he now to do the more he had of late thought of elizabeth the more completely he found that she had entwined herself round his heart and he had anticipated the delight of meeting her again and receiving her as his bride from the hands of her parents all these delightful visions had now vanished monsieur and madame de mertens received him with every expression of regard and affection i can never forget the important service you rendered me in restoring to me my husband said madame de mertens and i feel sure that had it been in your power you would have brought back to me my child even now i have a hope that you may possibly restore her to me jack spent some time with his friends and finally came to the resolution of returning to the west indies in order to make inquiries about elizabeth and dame pearson i will first go to the admiralty and ascertain where the venus frigate now is and then i will communicate with captain davis said dean should he be unable to give me the information i desire i will immediately set off on my projected voyage captain dean had been invited to return to mr gournay's to supper on entering the house the excellent quaker met him with a letter in his hand i have just received this he said from your brother-in-law giles dainsforth he mentions a curious circumstance which occurred some time ago which may tend to solve the mystery concerning the fate of elizabeth de mertens and her friend he writes me word that information had been received in the plantation of the wreck of a ship on an island off the american coast with several passengers among whom were said to be some ladies a small boat which had left the island had after a long voyage the people undergoing great hardships reached the mainland they had come in the hopes of obtaining relief for those left behind as soon as the information was received a meeting of the inhabitants of philadelphia was held and it was resolved to send out a vessel for the rescue of the sufferers unfortunately friend giles does not mention the name of the vessel or the passengers except casually he refers to the loss of a queen's ship this was indeed important information it raised captain dean's hopes of the possibility of discovering elizabeth at the same time he was well aware that there were many probabilities of the wreck being that of some other vessel 
friend dainsforth is very anxious that we should send out a vessel with a cargo of which he may dispose it is a business in which i myself am not willing to enter observed mr gournay but thou mayest find friends in nottingham who will be more ready to engage in the speculation and being thyself a seaman of experience thou mightest take command of it it will be far better for thee than following the occupation of fighting in which thou hast been engaged the plan thus suggested by mr gournay was much in accordance with jack's taste he however made up his mind in the first instance to go to london that he might make inquiries as to the fate of the venus if she had left the west indies and had not since been heard of or if it was supposed that she had been cast away he would then have very little doubt of her being the ship of which giles dainsforth spoke but if on the contrary she had returned to england or been sent to some other station he would then only suppose that the wreck alluded to in the letter must be that of another ship and thus proceeding to pennsylvania would in no way forward the great object he had in view mr gournay having fully agreed with him in the wisdom of his plans after he had bidden farewell to monsieur and madame de mertens he set off on his visit to london jack felt very differently from what he did before on his first visit to the metropolis in company with long sam he was now a captain in the navy with an honorable name and money in his pocket on going to the admiralty however he could gain no satisfactory information regarding the venus or captain davis one of the clerks told him that he believed she was still in the west indies another that she had been captured by the enemy a third of whom in his despair he made further inquiries told him that she had been sunk and another that she was on her passage home he had just left the office and was taking his way disconsolately along the street when he met an old shipmate my dear fellow he exclaimed you did not employ a golden key i suspect to unlock the mystery just go back with a doubloon in your hand and cross the palm of master dick gritifist and you will soon find that he knows more about the matter than you supposed jack though indignant that such a proceeding should be necessary did as he was advised oh certainly captain dean answered dick it was about the venus you were inquiring oh ah let me see she was ordered home in seventeen o two and immediately afterwards the order was countermanded and she remained on the station for some time longer since then she was sent to visit the plantations on the mainland of north america and in consequence of her not having been heard of for some time it is feared that she must have met with some disaster as soon as she had executed her mission she was to return home and i know that some months ago she was expected this was all the information jack required he did not tell master greedifist the opinion he had formed of him but hastening out of the office took his way to his inn jack as has been seen was a man of action he took care of the minutes well knowing that the hours would take care of themselves as soon as he had sufficiently fortified the inner man he again mounted his horse and leaving all the wonders of london unvisited spurred back northward towards nottingham at the inn where he rested the first night of his journey he wrote an account of the information he had gained to his friends at norwich saying that he proposed carrying out the plan suggested by giles dainsforth and that as soon as he could make the arrangements he hoped to sail in a galley for pennsylvania on reaching home he found that dainsforth had expressed the same opinion to his friends at nottingham he had therefore little difficulty in inducing them to join in a speculation for the purchase of a galley to be freighted with goods suitable for the plantations he himself having the command of her 
having made all the preliminary arrangements he was about to start for london when he received information from mr gournay that a galley admirably suited for his object was about to be launched at lynn regis scarcely had the letter been read when jack was on horseback and spurring forward to that town he was not disappointed in the appearance of the vessel she was stoutly built and roomy capable of carrying a large cargo as she reached the water she was named the nottingham galley john deane whose manners were such as to gain the confidence of his fellow-men soon found a hardy crew to man her by the time she was ready for sea he had obtained a considerable share of his prize-money his brother jasper his cousin nat and his father with several other influential persons at nottingham took shares in the speculation it would be impossible to follow dean in his various journeys backwards and forwards to norwich lynn and nottingham while the galley was getting ready for sea at length having received a part of her cargo on board sent from norwich and nottingham Chapter thirty six of John Dean of Nottingham Historic Adventures by Land and Sea. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. John Dean of Nottingham Historic Adventures by Land and Sea by William Henry Giles Kingston chapter thirty six adventure in the nottingham galley shipwreck captain john deane had now launched forth in a new character that of a merchant adventurer especially honoured in those days as it deserved to be the merchant adventurers a century and a half ago were the promoters of civilization the founders of kingdoms while they were generally distinguished by their courage perseverance and honourable conduct the nottingham galley had a crew of forty men and she mounted twenty guns with which her captain hoped to defend her against any enemies she might encounter he had hitherto been a successful man and he began to think that it would never be his lot to be otherwise the voyage was prosperous till the nottingham galley was within fifty leagues of the american coast a furious gale then sprang up and thick weather came on so that no observations could be taken dean endeavoured to bring the ship to that he might keep off the coast till the weather should moderate in vain however did he make the attempt the aftermasts were carried away and now the ship could only run before the gale it being feared every moment that the seas which came roaring up astern would break on board he hoped however that the weather might moderate before they reached the entrance of the delaware river up which the galley was bound vain hope the darkness of night came on and instead of moderating the gale increased the crew hardy as they were clung to the bulwarks and the shrouds expecting that every moment would be their last still the fury of the tempest increased the wind whistled through the shrouds and the seas raged up alongside a loud roar was heard ahead breakers breakers shouted the crew the next instant there came a fearful crash the helpless galley was driven forward amid the rocks the seas swept over her many were washed away or dashed furiously against the rocks dean felt himself lifted up by a sea which dashed against the devoted vessel he suspected that the fate which had overtaken many of his crew would now be his onward the ship bore him he struck out struggling bravely for life his feet touched the hard sand and the next instant he was thrown high upon the beach he staggered forward and before the following sea had reached him he had escaped from its clutches the despairing shrieks of his crew reached his ears in vain he endeavoured to render them assistance he rescued two however 
at the risk of being himself thrown back into the foaming surges three others had been thrown as he had been on shore when morning at length broke they were the only survivors of the gallant band which had manned the nottingham galley captain dean's first thought was that possibly this might be the very island on which the venus had been cast away supposing it to be an island of which he was not yet sure a vague feeling that even now elizabeth and mistress pearson might be living on it induced him immediately to set forth to explore the country he had not gone far before in front of him he saw several huts constructed evidently out of the wreck of a vessel he hurried on eager to communicate with the inhabitants whom he expected to find within them as he reached the huts however he soon saw by the open doors and the silence which reigned on every side that they were deserted on searching around however he discovered signs that they had been inhabited by a considerable number of persons one of the huts built at a short distance from the others was constructed in a better style it was closed by a door placed on hinges and there was a window which could be closed by a shutter he lifted the latch there were two neat bed places within and on the table some small shreds of silk and a few other articles such as were used by females met his sight this then might possibly have been the abode of elizabeth he looked eagerly around with tender interest in the hope of finding some sign by which he might ascertain the truth all the articles of value had been removed but still it was evident that the hut had been abandoned somewhat suddenly at length he found an object sticking between the crib and the wall as if it had fallen down between them it was a book he opened it eagerly on the blank page at the commencement were the letters e p he had no longer any doubt that it was the property of elizabeth he placed it in his bosom and continued the search there could be no doubt then that the vessel which giles dainsforth had mentioned as being on the point of sailing in search of the shipwrecked crew had reached the place and carried them off in safety for this he was truly thankful delighted as he would have been to have found elizabeth still there as he had almost expected to do on his return he told his companions what he had discovered their spirits revived as they began to hope that some vessel might pass that way and carry them to the plantation as they gazed however on the ocean covered with foaming billows their condition seemed perilous indeed of the ship herself not a plank clung together though the beach was strewed with various articles which had formed her cargo one of her boats too had been cast ashore without receiving any material damage dean immediately summoned his men around him and pointed out to them the necessity of saving whatever provisions were washed on shore by this time the gale had considerably abated and they were enabled to drag up several casks and cases containing food which they so much required in the same way numerous bales and other articles which had formed the cargo of the ship were saved they found themselves on an uninhabited island of small extent which seemed likely to afford them but scanty means of subsistence in the far distance could be seen a long blue ridge of land which dean knew must be the continent their great requirement however was water for without it their stores and flour would have availed them but little they therefore immediately set about searching for it and at length a slight moisture was found oozing out from beneath the roots of a large tree after eagerly scraping away the earth with their hands for some time the hole they had formed was filled with a small portion of the precious liquid this encouraged them to hope that a sufficient supply might be obtained and with better heart than they had hitherto possessed they took their first meal on the island on examining the boat captain dean was of opinion that if repaired she would carry them to the mainland 
but as yet there were no tools found by which this could be accomplished thus were all their hopes of escaping frustrated their life on the island was that of most shipwrecked mariners even when partaking of their meals they could not but feel that their store of provisions would in time come to an end and that thus unless relieved famine would overtake them at last several days passed by when as two of their number were wandering along the shore a chest was seen fixed between two rocks summoning their companions not without difficulty they waded towards it it was found to be a carpenter's chest after considerable labor they contrived to break it open when to their great joy they discovered within it a supply of tools and nails with iron hoops and other necessary articles they now eagerly set to work to repair their boat but as none of them were carpenters they found it a more difficult task than they had expected spars and oars and sails had also to be formed no one however was idle and they made up by diligence what they wanted in skill the boat was at last launched and moored between the rocks all the provisions they could collect with a supply of water in such casks as would hold it were placed on board they had left the island astern when a sail appeared in sight rapidly approaching them from the east dean supposing she was some vessel bound up the delaware for philadelphia hove to proposing if such was the case to take a passage in her instead of risking the voyage in their open boat still imperfectly repaired as she drew near she was seen to be a large ship carrying several guns yet she wanted the trim appearance of a man-of-war no colors were flying at her masthead or peak and altogether her appearance did not satisfy captain dean it was now however too late to avoid her already the boat must have been seen by those on board still dean thought it more prudent to fill his sails and to stand away towards the opening which he took to be the mouth of the river of which he was in search a shot from the ship told him that he had been discovered it was the signal to sheer alongside and to come on board there was no use attempting to disobey this order as they were already under the ship's guns having secured the boat alongside dean and his men stepped on deck from the appearance of the officers and the number of men composing the mongrel-looking crew on board who seemed to be of all countries and of all shades of colour the thought at once occurred to captain dean that the vessel was a pirate what have you been about and where are you going asked a man who stepped forward from among the people on board though considerably older and knocked about by climate and hardship dean had little difficulty in recognizing his former acquaintance pearson the pirate captain looked at him two or three times but if he had recognized him for a moment he soon seemed to have altered his opinion jack felt that the best plan whether he was right or wrong in his conjectures was to tell the whole truth of himself pearson seemed interested in hearing nottingham spoken of and it made him give another glance at dean ah well my man he said we wish you no harm but we can allow no vessel to proceed to the new plantations that's a hard rule sir answered jack as we are likely enough to starve on the island we have just left and if we remain at sea we shall perish in the next gale that comes on you have your remedy said the pirate captain you may join our brave crew you shall be an officer on board and your men shall share with the rest we cannot accept your offer answered dean and perhaps for old acquaintance sake master pearson you will grant my request the pirate captain started on hearing himself thus addressed who are you he asked looking again hard at dean one you knew in his youth and who has never ceased to wish you well answered jack you have served one sovereign i have fought under the flag of another do you know me now yes indeed i do though you are greatly changed from the stripling you were when i knew you answered pearson stretching out his hand i wish you well for i thought you a brave and honest youth 
and i am thankful to find you took your own course now as i believe you to be unchanged the promise i ask you to make if i allow you to proceed is that you will not give information of my vessel being off the coast dean was rather perplexed what answer to make no he answered at last i wish you no harm at the same time i cannot allow any honest traitor to fall into your hands now hear me master pearson my object in coming out here is to carry home two persons in whom you were once greatly interested the little elizabeth whom you protected in her youth and your own wife who i am sure you once loved i throw myself therefore on your generosity pearson seemed greatly agitated for some minutes i will not interfere with you he answered i cannot force that poor lady to undergo the hardships into which i once led her and i will therefore leave her to your kindness and charity i would that i could accompany you but i cannot desert my comrades but the time may come ere long that i may enable them to secure their own safety and i will then if i still have the means endeavor to visit pennsylvania much on the same subject passed between the two former acquaintances the pirate ship towed the boat to the mouth of the delaware when the latter cast off and stood chapter thirty seven of john dean of nottingham historic adventures by land and sea this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b john dean of nottingham historic adventures by land and sea by william henry giles kingston pennsylvania return home last adventures and conclusion captain dean and his companions had a prosperous voyage up the delaware and in two days the buildings of the new city appeared in sight standing at the junction of the delaware and the schuylkill the delaware is a noble stream and the schuylkill is as broad as its mouth as the thames is at woolwich the banks of the great river above which the town was laid out were bold and high the air pure and wholesome while the neighboring lands were free from swamps altogether the site was one admirably fitted for the purpose of a great city clay for making bricks was found on the spot and quarries of good stone abounded within a few miles already the city was laid out according to the design of its sagacious founder but as yet although a considerable number of houses had been erected near to each other forming streets many were only scattered about here and there according as the owners had purchased their town lots two streets one of them facing a magnificent row of red pines were planned to front the rivers the great public thoroughfare alone separated the houses from the banks it was arranged that these streets were to be connected by the high street a magnificent avenue perfectly straight and a hundred feet in width to be adorned with trees and gardens at a right angle with the high street a broad street of equal width was to cut the city in two from north to south it was thus divided into four sections in the exact center of the city a large square of ten acres was reserved for the advantage of the public and in the middle of each quarter a smaller square of eight acres was set apart for the same purpose eight streets each fifty feet wide were to be built parallel to the high street and twenty of the same width parallel to the rivers mr penn's great object was to give a rural appearance to the houses of his new city the boat reached the shore before a large building which from the signboard swinging in front of it on which a large blue anchor was painted was known to be a house of entertainment dean and his companions hauling up their boat hastened towards it as he hoped there to obtain the information 
as to where giles danesforth and his sister were to be found this building was then one of the most important in the province it was not only a beer house but an exchange a corn market and a post office it was formed of large rafters of wood the interstices being filled with bricks which had been brought in the vessels from england in the same manner as houses to be found in cheshire and some built in the tudor and stuart periods already a magnificent quay of three hundred feet in length had been formed by the side of the river and there were also stone houses with pointed roofs and balconies and porches in different parts although in some portions of the city pine trees and pine stumps still remained altogether upwards of a thousand houses had been erected among them was a large building devoted to the purposes of a public school or college a printing press had long been established in the city by william bradford a native of leicester who had accompanied mr penn in the welcome dean had however but little inclination to view the city until he had found his way to the house of his sister and brother-in-law he had no great difficulty in discovering it for giles danesforth was already well known as a man of mark as sagacious steady and industrious men are sure to be in a new settlement there is friend danesforth house said a worthy citizen to whom dean addressed himself and he saw before him a fine and substantial stone building with a broad veranda surrounded by trees and flowering shrubs a gentle voice reached his ears singing an air he knew well the door stood open and he entered passing through the house he saw seated on a lawn beneath the shade of the building three ladies while the same number of young children played about them the nearest he recognized as his sister kate though grown into more matronly proportions than when he had last seen her near her was a fair girl he required not a second glance to convince him that she was elizabeth he hurried forward forgetting how he might startle them a cry of delight escaped elizabeth as she advanced to meet him in another minute he found himself in the arms of his sister while a sob of joy escaped from her companion's bosom he's come he's come she exclaimed i knew he would find us the third lady was mistress pearson she looked careworn and aged as if her life had well nigh come to an end their history was soon told when at length captain davis was ordered to visit the plantations previous to returning to england he obtained permission to receive them on board and to convey them home when the ship was cast away with a few only of the crew had been rescued the captain however although he was the last to leave the ship had also been saved dean had fortunately told elizabeth of the marriage of giles danesforth to his sister and of their intention of settling in pennsylvania on their arrival therefore at philadelphia hearing his name she made herself known to him and it was thus that she and mistress pearson became inmates of his house in a short time giles danesforth himself accompanied by captain davis arrived at the house and a happy party were soon assembled round the supper-table dean heard a great deal of the flourishing condition of the plantation and of its vast internal resources he heard too from danesforth that the settlers had resolved not to allow the importation of slaves into the colony they had established it because they themselves loved freedom and they were resolved to employ free men alone in the cultivation of their lands he also heard that the whole territory had been purchased from the native tribes and that not the life of a single red man had been taken away by the settlers since their arrival in the country from the first they had lived on the most friendly terms with the native tribes this was indeed glorious news especially in those days when the traffic in negroes was looked upon as lawful and when in most instances might made right in all parts of the world altogether the account which dean received of the colony was so favorable that he could not help longing to come and settle in it he had however promised to bring elizabeth back to her parents 
and poor mistress pearson also was very anxious to lay her bones in her native land captain davis likewise desired to return home on the first opportunity that he might stand his trial for the loss of his ship which he considered himself in honor bound to do dean however resolved not to run the risk of again being separated from elizabeth she having no legal guardian he instituted himself as such and then gave himself permission to marry her which she nothing loath consented to do forthwith the marriage was celebrated with such religious and legal ceremonies as were then considered sufficient in philadelphia colonel markham the acting governor being one of the witnesses jack and his bride accompanied by captain davis and his sister soon afterwards embarked on board a stout ship sailing for england they arrived safely in london whence jack wrote to norwich to announce his safe return a few days were spent in the great city that elizabeth might recruit her strength after her voyage during his stay there he met with an old brother officer captain bertrand who hailing him with pleasure told him that he was the very man he was looking out for i have taken service he said with the permission of the british government under the czar of russia the great peter for such he is indeed you will remember his laboring as a shipwright in england not many years since to gain a knowledge of shipbuilding he is now constructing a large fleet and he is anxious to secure the services of a number of active and intelligent officers like yourself what do you say i can promise you handsome pay and the command of a line of battle ship dean replied that he must think about it as he had only lately married a wife and had no inclination to leave her oh you must bring her with you was the answer you can establish her in the new city the czar is building on the neva and depend upon it you will have no long cruises to make foreign officers can be found but he will have a difficulty in making seamen out of his serfs free men only are fit to become seamen in my opinion captain dean begged that his friend would give him his address and should he determine to accept his offer after he had visited his friends he would communicate with him leaving the unhappy mistress pearson with her brother dean set forward in a coach with his bride for norwich he had fortunately been able to procure the balance of prize money due to him while he was in london which amounted to a considerable sum and he was thus in spite of his heavy loss in the nottingham galley no longer crippled by want of means words can scarcely describe the joy with which madame de mertin and her husband received their long-lost daughter though she had grown from a young child into a woman they immediately recognized her while the trinket she had preserved prevented them having any doubt about the matter after spending some time at norwich and receiving great kindness from the excellent mr gournay and his lady the young couple repaired to nottingham the loss of the nottingham galley however caused jack to be more coolly received by his friends than he had anticipated in vain he tried to explain to them that they should find fault with the elements more than with him for the ill success of their speculation he undertook if it was their wish to command another galley and to embark all his property in the enterprise to this however none of them would agree yet there were two of his friends who received him in a different manner to the rest his sister polly and his sister-in-law alethea prosperity had not improved his brother jasper and he appeared to be more bitter than any of the family who suffered from the wreck of the galley a reconciliation was however at last brought about by cousin nat and polly jack had been dining at the house of his sister and her husband where he met jasper to whose house in fletchergate he agreed to walk in the evening on their way some remarks made by dr jasper irritated john dean as he considered them unfair and unjust and angry words were heard by some of the passers-by uttered by him to his brother they reached the door together a flight of stone steps led to it from the street unhappily at this moment the doctor repeated the expressions which had justly offended the captain who declared that he would not allow himself 
to be addressed in so injurious a manner as he spoke he pushed impatiently past his brother who at that moment stumbled down the steps the doctor fell and as captain dean stooped to lift him up to his horror he found that he was dead rumor with her hundred tongues forthwith spread the report that the fire-eating captain had killed his brother the verdict however of the jury who sat to decide the case was that dr jasper dean had died by the visitation of god still captain dean was conscious of the angry feelings which had excited his bosom at the moment and he felt that the mark of cain was upon his forehead he could no longer remain at home and though those who loved him best knew of his innocence and did their utmost to console him he determined to leave the country he accordingly wrote to captain bertrand accepting his offer of a naval command under the czar of russia and in a short time he and elizabeth sailed for the baltic he rendered great assistance in organizing the navy of that wonderful man peter the great and after serving with much credit for a few years he returned to england captain dean had during this time found a number of friends and by their means he was soon afterwards appointed english consul at ostend where he lived with his wife elizabeth till they were both advanced in life as an elderly couple they came back to nottingham once more and went to live in the sweet village of wilford on the opposite side of the silvery trent it was the peaceful green retreat that had beckoned him back to england from many a scene of foreign grandeur and smiled across many a time of tumult and of battle he and his wife both loved the dutch home where they had so long lived and when he built a house for himself in a thorough english village he constructed it in the dutch style which indeed in his early youth had been the very height of fashion next to his own behind the same trim garden and row of silvery poplars he built one also for his sister polly who was then a widow alethea after the death of her husband had returned to harwood grange with her children and devoted herself to them endeavouring so to bring them up that they might love and serve god she by this time had also gone to her rest so also had most of those who have been mentioned in the previous history mistress pearson did not live long after her return to england and she was saved the misery of hearing the tragical death of her husband who with all his faults had at all events loved her in a desperate action with the queen's ship he with all his crew had been blown up shortly after dean had encountered him at the mouth of the delaware the tomb of john dean captain r n and of elizabeth his wife is to be seen on a little green promontory above the sparkling trent and near the chancel of the parish church where sweet strains of music accompanying the sound of human voices and the murmurs of the river are wont to mingle in harmonious hymns of prayer and praise a more fitting spot in which to await in readiness for the last hour of life than wilford can scarcely be imagined nor a sweeter place than its churchyard in which the mortal may lie down to rest from toil <laughs>